So my name is Katie Cunningham. Um, I am a Python and Django developer for Cox Media Group, and I'm also an author for Pearson and O'Reilly. And I happen to write, I wrote this book last year. Uh, it came out in August. It's a very thin book, so if you want to read more about accessibility, you can get through it in an afternoon. So what is accessibility? Um, accessibility is basically all of the data and all of the functionality for all of the users. The way I like to think about it is that accessibility is actually usability for a set of users who have additional needs. Now, what does this mean? You know, people forget that people who are blind or deaf or have other issues still want easy to use websites. And they still want, you know, sites that aren't, you know, overcomplicated or too busy. They want the same websites you want, but they have a few additional needs that you need to consider. Um, also, this is my approach towards accessibility. I tend to approach accessibility from a usability angle by learning about and talking about the different groups that accessibility does cover. So who does it cover? Well, for one, it covers the visually disabled. This isn't just blind people. This also covers people who cannot have their vision corrected to 2080 um, and people who are colorblind. It also covers the physically disabled. Anybody who has any kind of motion disorders, they might be an amputee. Um, they might be paralyzed, they might have jerky motion, or they might have a time limit on how, how, how long they can move. So somebody who has RSI or arth arthritis. The hearing disabled is not only the deaf community, but it's also um, people who are hearing aids. One of the misconceptions about hearing aids is that it fixes everything. And as somebody who has mild hearing loss, no, they don't fix anything. Um, they do amplify some noises, but it doesn't backfill in the noises you're missing if you actually can't hear at that level. So, you know, that's, you know, so you have the partially deaf, you have profoundly deaf, um, and there are some people where even if they wear, wear hearing aids, it's not going to fix their hearing. And finally, a new group, the cognitively disabled. This is a group that in the past five years has gotten much more vocal and much more organized. Uh, this includes people who have conditions like dyslexia. They may have ADD or ADHD. Um, these, this does not always mean like mentally retarded. These are people that just have information processing disorders. So first, let's cover the blind. Um, what is blind? This seems like a really silly question, uh, but every you know, group has a different way of defining blind. You can be legally blind and you can't drive your car, but you still use a computer in the same way that, you know, a sighted person does. Um, you can be blind enough to get a grant for, you know, or to get a tax deduction. In our case, it's actually really simple. If they use a screen reader to access their, to use their computer, we're going to consider them blind. So screen readers. Um, every computer has a screen reader on it. Uh, they all come with it installed. Linux sometimes chops it off, but for the most part, every Linux dish drive I've ever come across has one installed. Their features are, is one thing they do is they read all the text on the screen, which seems really obvious. It'll also do things like it'll list all of the headers or it'll list all the links on a page. The reason it does this is because that's how a user scans the page. In the same way you would scroll very quickly through a page to find what's relevant to you, they would listen to a list of headers or they would listen to a list of links. It also reads the metadata, the metadata. So tables have metadata, images have metadata. And here's some um, screen readers. Um, and most of these are included. Uh, JAWS is the one that is commercial, and it is crazy dollars. Uh, it's like $900 for one license. Um, but if you have a Mac, you, know, you can actually turn on VoiceOver now if you hit Command F5. Um, some of the annoyances that the blind deal with. Um, images with text, na text naturally. Screen readers cannot read text and images. Um, this is really obvious, but a lot of people forget this. Um, missing alt text, which we'll go over what alt text is. Um, bad HTML. My computer's getting really slow for some reason. Flash is extremely annoying. I've actually gotten into like, I almost got kicked out of a bar because I was arguing with the guy over Flash um, and it not being accessible. Um, tables that don't have, have, have tables that don't have scoping. We'll go over that. Uh, frames, repetition, and modals. Sorry. So one of the things with good HTML, you have to validate your HTML. 
you can use Chrome and Firebug. You know, as long as you can get by those and, you're, and it validates and it's not throwing any errors, you're fine. Um, the W3C has a validator. I found it to be a little bit too persnickety, and you can spend like hours and hours and hours trying to chase down that one circular thing that's going wrong. You can ignore that, as long as you have the other two. And I'm actually surprised that I still have to tell people to validate their HTML. You'd think we'd get it after, you know, what, two decades? So for the blind, you also want to add something called ARIA landmarks. These are what landmarks are. Um, now, ARIA, does anybody know what ARIA is? We have a couple hands. Um, ARIA is one of the newest parts of the HTML spec before HTML5, and it's actually one of the fastest to go through, which is really exciting. Basically, it gives roles to elements. Um, it tells a screen reader and other applications what they're dealing with. So if you say you have a div, and you give it a role of navigation, it knows it's a navigation element. And a screen reader can go, hey, there's a navigation element. You want to go skip to that? If you give it a role of main, it'll say, well, here's a main landmark. Do you want to go to this landmark? Um, or if it's an application, something they may, might want to interact with at an application level, they can go to that. They can just jump to it. They can jump around the page. It makes it much faster to get around. Also, you want to use your headers as headers. This is something I see all the time, especially since Bootstrap. I love Bootstrap, but they've convinced people to not use headers like they should. Um, you want your headers to first be used as headers, and you don't want to skip them. Um, you don't want to have like a header one, and then a header four, and then a header six. You want to use header one, header two, header three. Screen readers can work around this, but we are dealing with HTML as semantic. You know, just because you like the style better, there's other ways to do that. Um, to style it in a certain way than to say, well, I like the way header four looks, so I'm going to use that here. Don't do that, because headers are also announced. As it says, it'll say header one, Dayton Daily News. If all of a sudden it moves to header four, it sounds like data was skipped. And unfortunately, if you use a screen reader, that's really common that chunks of pages will disappear because they landed somewhere else that they can't access. So alt text. Some guidelines. Um, alt text is what you put on images. So that when you when a screen reader pulls them up, it'll you know read out some text. Um, you want alt text for almost everything. Um, there are still some things like if you have an icon, you don't need to put alt text on it. If you have a space or a GIF, I don't know why you're using, but you don't need to have alt text on it. Um, you're not enriching anybody's experience by putting like you know image spacer. Nobody's being enriched by that. You want to include the text that's in the image. That's you know, pretty intuitive. And you really only want to talk about the relevant parts of the image. You don't want to get crazy like descriptive on it. Um, the amount of text you have in the alt text should be directly proportional to the amount of information you would be giving to a sighted user. So if it's just a pretty image that you put in there, just say pretty image of sunset. That's really all you need to say. You don't need to describe every duck. So let's go some examples. Um, bad alt text, nothing. <laughs> Unless you know that you really do need nothing, you really want to avoid that. Um, saying image, oh, thanks. Because then it'll say image, image. Um, map, OK, we know what it is, but not why you have it. Um, here's some OK examples. Picture of a 747. You really don't need to say picture of. They know it's a picture. That's what an image is. We don't need to say picture of. And the 747 isn't that descriptive. A boy with balloon, eh, you know, that's, that may be OK. Um, this one just goes overboard. You don't need this. I can't imagine anywhere where that would be really relevant to the text of the article. So some of the best stuff. Um, if you're doing an article on helium, this is really good. You know, it explains that there's a boy. He's reaching for a balloon. It's floating away. You don't need to know where. This is exactly how much information you'd probably need. Or if you're trying, you know, this pretty much describes that one panel um, of Charlie Brown. It doesn't go overboard, but it gets the point across. Captions. Now, most of you have images like this, where you'll have an image and a nice little caption beneath. Um, captions should work with the alt text. They should not copy the alt text. I can't tell you how many times I have failed a 508 scan because the person putting the data in put the same text in the alt text field as they did for the caption. If you control the back end or the forms that, get, that makes, this, makes this get done, put a check in. Trust me, because somebody's just going to copy it. And they'll have to hear the same stupid thing twice. 
Um, the alt text must mirror the text and images. So like here, this is actually from WebAIM. This is a great accessibility site, and it's exactly what's on there. But why do you have text in an image? Um, you can use web fonts. They've been around for a while. Most browsers support them now. Um, they look nice. Many times they're smaller. Um, and it really eliminates your need for alt text, because even if you use a pretty font, it can be read. So consider like why you're actually putting text in an image, especially if you have like those pullouts where you have a quote from an article or something like that. Um, and I know I'm talking about this a lot. We'll move on quickly. Don't worry about it. Um, so text should usually be reflected in the alt tag, but there are some exceptions, some logos. This is from one of our um, newspapers. And screen readers, when they read it out, say, adjets, adjets, adjets. And it just drives me insane. And you actually want to separate those out, A, J, C. So you might want to listen to it on a screen reader to hear how it's actually being read out. You can also eliminate things like www and .com, even if that's in the image, because our eyes actually just glance over it. Um, if you call it the Statesman logo, like one of our, one, another one of our properties, you can just say Statesman or the statesman. You don't need to have www, whatever. So tables. Tables are for tabular data. If you'd want to put it in an Excel sheet and sort it, then you can put it in a table. I give you permission. So something like this, that goes into a table. You want to scope them. Now what scoping is, is for every column header, you would say, these are my columns. For every row, you say, this is a row. Um, the reason you do that is because then it's read out like this. It'll say the column, the content, the column, the content. And it'll say, you know, new row. And it's, if you have a, if you have something that looks like this, can you imagine trying to remember which column it was? You would get lost very easily. So you need to scope everything. And it doesn't take that long. Um, tables as layout, don't do it. I can't believe I'm still seeing this. I'm hoping that because you guys are front end, I normally talk to back end people, and they're like, but, 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 no, it's okay, you know, no, just don't do it. Uh, it messes up screen readers, seriously. Um, there really is no need for it, and all it says is that you don't know how to use CSS properly. You also need to put summaries on tables. Um, why you do this is because a person who's cited does not read every line. We glance over and get information. So you put a summary that basically summarizes what the table has in it. Chances are a blind person isn't going to want to read through every line, because I know sighted people don't read through every line either. So it would just be like this table summary, and then some kind of, you know, you know, say like, OK, what's the trend? Is there an upward trend? Is there a downward trend? It changes in June. What are you trying to get across to the table? I assume there's a reason it's there. Flash. You can make accessible Flash, I'm told. But why? We have so many better tools. Um, and does your site need it? Um, do you need that Flash thing? I mean, I've now seen Doom and HTML5 and JavaScript, so I don't see why we need to have the navigation in the Flash. Um, if somebody's pushing you to have Flash on your site, um, I know people. We can make them disappear. Just give me a call. <laughs> And I mean, what if Flash isn't an option? Hello, smartphones. You know, a lot of them can't support Flash. So you really don't need it. Um, back to ARIA. Um, ARIA is so very important. Um, and we went over this, that it is, um, it gives like landmarks, you know, and that's just only one small part. That's the easy part of ARIA. The other parts of it, which we'll go over more later, because ARIA affects lots of groups. Um, but when you do it, it not only tells what an object is, it tells it how to interact with it. So it'll do things like make sliders accessible. And it's in jQuery. It's big time in jQuery, especially jQuery UI. If you look through it, and just look for ARIA, because anything that's ARIA enabled has ARIA in it, and look through the source code, you'll see lots and lots and lots of examples of it being brought in. And we'll go over some um, examples at, towards the end of the talk. Um, dialogues and modals. Um, these present a particular challenge, because if you have a modal that pops up, um, screen readers do not always know what to do with it. It's like, well, you added some HTML, but often it's added to the end of the page, because that's where we like to tack things. We'll just put them on the end, because that's easy. Um, it's not, the screen reader isn't there yet. It's not going to read it, even if it's in the middle of the page. Um, so 
part of it that goes wrong is it doesn't know it's there. Um, there's no focus control. You know, you didn't move the focus. So the person's like going, well, I hit sign in register. Nothing happened. Okay, maybe, you know, and they know a new page didn't load because the screen reader would have said something. Um, you really need ARIA if you're going to use modals. This data dump um, is an ARIA, is a dialogue with ARIA. Let me explain a few things that are going on here. You've got, it has a role of dialogue. So now he knows, okay, this is a dialogue. We know what's going on here. Um, you have a label and you have a, descri a description. So it's labeled by and described by, and then we have a title and a description. So it knows when it pops up, hey, screen reader, there's a modal. Um, it's called this and this is what it's doing. Because these are things that you can get at a glance um, that they can't. So it'll say, you know, oh, this modal popped up, and by the way, it says you're about to be timed out and you can't purchase your tickets. Um, is your modal important? Is it something like you are timing out, um, you've made an error, something really important the person needs to know about, hey, there's a hurricane or something like that heading your way? You want to use alert dialog. Alert dialog is much more insistent, and depending on like the screen reader, it acts a little differently, but basically it'll interrupt. It'll say, it'll stop whatever it's doing and say, sorry, um, it'll stop whatever it's doing and saying, no, no, you need to pay attention to this, this is important. Um, because if you, even if you have like red flashing things, how's the blind person going to see that? They're not going to see how you visually indicated something was important. So moving on to low vision. This is, these again are people that cannot have their vision corrected to 2080 or people who left their glasses at home. Um, that's never happened to me. Um, some of their annoyances, designs that don't grow. If you've ever hit like, you know, command plus and minus to make sites bigger and smaller, that's what I mean by grow. Poor contrast, um, because when you have visual issues, um, having good contrast helps quite a bit. Default styles you can't override. Some of them will try to override styles, like they can't read black text, like back, black background with white text, so they'll try to like switch them. Um, and text and images, and we'll go over why. Forms are a problem too. Um, some of the tools, some of them use custom style sheets that they will go ahead and say, every time you see a paragraph, just set it to this size. Um, many of them will use magnifiers. There's actually like, I think there's one on Windows, I know there's one on Mac, where you can say like a magnifier in the bottom part of the screen, it'll follow the cursor, and it'll make the page really big. Increasing the page size is really common. Um, so for low vision growing, why is this a problem? Well, this is why this is a problem. Um, here I have a little fake navigation, but I assure you these are in the wild too. You start to lose content because you don't have overflow. There's many reasons why this can happen. You should check for, you know, make your screen, may, when you have a site and you're testing it, just go up three levels and look and make sure that you can still get to all the content and read all the content. Um, poor contrast, this is a problem because they already have fuzzy vision, like you're already not seeing very clearly. Um, if you have something like, you see this all the time, where it's like a light gray background, slightly darker gray text. And it's very arty, and it makes me want to punch my screen. Because that looks like gray. That's it. You know, it just looks like a gray slab. Don't do it. And I'm looking at you infographics people, because you're famous for it. So poor contrast, something like this. And this is bad, like if you have like a busy background, try to avoid busy backgrounds, because um, let's just be honest, we all hate it, so just don't do it. Um, some good contrast, and people are surprised, they think white and black are the best ones, actually. Ones that are slightly off white and slightly off black, or versions of like slightly, you know, green, dark green, um, those, these are the best contrasts to go with. So overriding styles, um, give them the chance to swap out a font. Um, so some fonts are made to be easier to read. So if they can go in and have a custom style sheet where they can just swap that out really quickly, that helps quite a bit. And same, change the colors. The way you do this, style at the top, style on the body, style on you know as high up as you can, and style once. You don't need to keep saying, oh, by the way, it's still off black. You don't need to do that. Also, um, let them change the background. You know, let them change, you know, and this is another reason why flash is still a big problem and I say it's inaccessible. You can't change any of those things and you can't change any of these things in flash. Not that anybody's ever shown me how. Um, and I would say 99.9% .9 of people who write flash applications never think to add those kind of things. Um, 
So text and images, the problem is, is that it doesn't grow. Um, this is an image I went way in, and I don't know if that's white flint or white ain't. Um, and I have good vision, so I can't imagine how somebody who has poor vision would deal with that. And the solutions are pretty easy. You either use web fonts, or if you have a complicated image like this, let them click through to a bigger image. Um, forms. Some of the problems with forms, um, people often use a bad layout for forms because they're mimicking paper forms. They're going like across. Now, happily, this is going away. Um, I'm seeing fewer and fewer instances of this. Um, but I still see this, um, where they, you can't tell where you're focused. Um, and how that looks is like this. You want to make sure that if somebody is in a field, that you can indicate the focus, because that cursor is really hard to see, no matter what you've done. So you know, here it's a little blue outline. You can see where the focus is. And the layout just goes straight down. That's the easiest to keep track of. It also looks the nicest for everybody. Um, the colorblind, it's not what you think. There are many types of colorblindness. This only shows three kinds of like the seven or 12 that they've found. Um, and it's not just not being able to see certain colors or whatever, it actually changes a lot of things. Like for instance, look at the last two. Um, what's the most intense color in the second to last column? And what's the most intense color in the last column? They're completely different. So if you're trying to show information through intensity, you're losing part of your audience. So some of their tools, um, they might override styles if they can. They might you know, use some browser add-ons. There's some standalone applications. However, these are not as well developed. Um, they don't have as many tools. as They're probably one of the ones that, well, probably one of the groups that has the fewest number of tools. So one of the things you need to do is check your contrast. Um, there's some really cool tools. There's like Color Oracle if you're on Mac. Um, there's a couple of add-ons for Adobe. Um, there's tons of them, and they're actually a lot of fun to play with. You can go through and see you know, your sites and see what it looks like in different kinds of colorblindness. Um, you'll want to include keys. Um, so if you have like a big map and you want to say this color is bad and this color is good, you need a key that says good and bad, even if you think you've been very clear. Um, because a red line, like this is from my metro in DC, um, they chose these colors very carefully. Um, you can still use red and green. That's fine, even though red and green is a, the most common kind of colorblindness. Um, you just have to pick them carefully, because otherwise you might end up with this. Now these dots, this is actually from my book. I, had, I, the, I stole the dots from another site, um, but I made a new like, fake website because I didn't want to get sued by Apple. These dots were from the iPhone. When it first came out, they had a bunch of dots that said whether your store had you know, the iPhone. And the dots were, we have it, we don't have, we don't have, we, we have it, we're running low, and we don't have it. That was what they looked like when you, if you had red-green color blindness. Um, so that's like 5% of all males. And happily, somebody pointed out and they fixed it, but I got the screen cap before they did. So I was super happy about that. Like, ah. You know, um, audio. Um, remember, these are people that are deaf. They are either profoundly deaf or wear hearing aids. Some of their annoyances, obviously, videos with no captioning. That's a little bit of a problem. Poor captioning. You can have captions that are really crap. Um, audio only alerts. And if you have poor quality live feeds, we'll go over why that's a problem. Always caption videos. If you have videos on your website, please, oh, please, oh, please look into a captioning service. They're out there. They exist. They're pretty reasonable. You know, they're not that expensive. Please caption videos. And also, don't use, um, don't assume it's like, oh, well, you can go on Google, on um, YouTube and just do automatic, you know, captions. Yeah, no, you can't. <laughs> they're funny, but they don't work. Give it five years. Uh, I'm sure it'll work great. But even then, we'll go over why that's still probably not going to be an option. So captioning. Um, this is an OK solution. This is what a lot of you see if you turn it on on your TVs. And well, one of the problems is this is called banding, and you band it over the action. The problem is, is that what's going on here? Where's the puck? What just happened? Um, better, and I see this more and more, is where you've got the text with an outline. The problem is, is that that's actually not very easy to read. People are like, oh, it's, it's really easy to read. No, it's not. 
you know, it always takes me a second to like read those. And if that's the only way you're getting information, it really sucks. The best is banding below. You don't miss any data, and it's, you still have nice captioning below the image. We are on the internet, and we have a big canvas to work with. We can spare a little room. Also, don't forget, you can format your captions. TVs can't format because TVs are stupid. Um, but your web browser and all, you are very smart. So you can actually make it look really nice and use a nice font and do capitalization correctly. Um, when you caption, off-screen sounds are important um, because it changes the tenor of what's going on. Um, you also want to talk about emotive elements because if you don't have somebody like full face, like facing the camera, it becomes increasingly hard the more they turn to figure out what emotion is happening. So this scene is definitely different depending if the guy's just talking to her or if he's like shouting at her. You also want to edit for flow. This is an unfortunate actual transcription of me doing a, um, introducing a poster and I was about to fall on my face. I was so tired. Um, and happily, someone was very kind to me when they captioned it because this is the caption they gave. It actually sounds like a human being. Um, and the reason, and it's like, remember, if you're not enriching their life, don't include it. I'm not enriching anybody's life by making them read through every um, um, er, and screw up. I'm backed up. It was like, oh, what, no, wait. And I was, I was really tired. Um, I actually did look like I was going to fall down. Um, also, watch your timing. Don't flood the screen um, where it's too fast to even read it. Uh, some, you know, many deaf people do actually read a bit faster, but not so much faster that you know, they have superhuman speed. And make sure the action matches the captions. This might mean editing. You might have to cut out some words um, to make it match. Now, visual bells, what I mean by this? Well, this should look familiar. It's, um, I think I was like in Google Mail, and these are two, um, two chat windows. And I just got somebody that pinged me. Uh, if it was just a bell, I wouldn't have actually noticed anything was going on. But this will flash blue and white. So it gets my attention. It also has a bell up in the um, title bar that'll say, hey, James messaged you. James messaged you, Jane. it'll keep flashing. It won't just change. You need to flash it to get attention. Um, also informative bells, this is um, Plants vs. Zombies, one of my favorite games. Um, and I actually, the first time I played through it, um, I didn't have, for some reason, I didn't have headphones. So I just played it with the sound off. And it got, all of a sudden, it was really hard. Like, these levels were super hard. I'm like, what happened? I kept losing. I was like the king of like, you know, plants versus zombies. And it's because there were very important sounds off screen. When you heard a sound, you had to start getting ready for an event. So I would have put a visual bell right there if the sound was off. I would have just put that in there and said, hey, you heard this sound. Um, live audio, you want to have clear audio. If you're going to depend, if something is live, and you're not going to have a chance to transcribe it, and you're betting on either you know, sign language or lip reading, it has to be clear. Um, I know this might be really hard. And it's just something to reach for. It's something to consider. If you can make it clearer, if you can up the bandwidth, great. Um, we're, we're hoping that we can get that. Um, and also, let them pick the focus. Um, this is a Google Hangout, and I pick on them a lot, because when they first came out, they had a lot of usability and accessibility issues. So all these people, only uh, there's five people, only one person's important. And you want to watch him. You don't care about anybody else. Let them choose the focus. When Hangouts first happened, you know, you couldn't actually pick the focus. Also, if you have live video or any kind of live event, make sure there's a chat. Um, make sure that they can, like, you've given them a voice. Um, and make sure others see the chat. This is another thing that Google Hangouts screwed up at first, that you could chat and nobody knew you had said anything. So we would have one poor guy that had no, he couldn't say anything, and he would kept typing in and trying to talk to us, and we didn't know. To the physical, some of their annoyances, requiring the mouse, requiring the keyboard, um, and precision. Now, why requiring the mouse and requiring the keyboard? Because some adaptive devices go through the mouse. Some go through the keyboard. Some people just can't use a mouse, and they use, um, they use tab to get around a website. Um, also, hair triggers. So you really have to watch out you know, for this group, because while they're a little bit all over the place, often you can solve many other problems together. We'll see. So radio and checkboxes. Um, most people should know this, but I still see occasionally people will not do this. Um, you need to have um, labels 
and you know, like um, IDs together because it makes it so you can click on a larger area to activate that. Um, drop down synop group, these are nice. Um, it makes it easier to actually navigate um, through, people forget these exist. They forget they can actually group things together, but it makes it much faster to navigate um, and to move quickly to the item you want. Oh God, these. I hate these so much. For a while it looked like they were dying and then they came back. Um, this is where you mouse over something and a pop-up comes up and the worst one have video. Um, they're really hard to close. You need a lot of precision and many times you cannot tab to them because of the way they were added. You can't actually close it. You have to reload the page and hope that you do not accidentally mouse over it or focus on that word again. If you use this, I please find a new ad vendor. You know, it's worth the money. Um, shadow boxes are fine. Shadow boxes are great. Make sure that when you hit escape, it closes. Um, this I still keep running into. People are like, oh, but they can hit the X. I'm like, no. Because sometimes you have to tap through the entire site to get to that stupid X. If they hit escape, it should close. And that X should be larger than 10 by 10. Navigation. Outline is zero or none. You'll see this. Who does this? Anybody do this? Yay, no hands. Don't do this. There is somewhere out there some like CSS reset sheet people use that has this. Yeah, they're wrong. They are the worst person ever. And I've been divorced, so that means something. <laughs> you probably don't know what this does. What outline does is when you hit tab, it shows where your focus is. It gives a nice little blue box depending on your browser. It's really cool. You can go through and you can style it. But if you hit it to zero, you made it go away. And now they can't use your site. Really, there's no, this isn't a, it's hard. They just can't use it. I've tried. Um, don't, if you find this, go look through your CSS tonight of all your sites. And if it, you have this, remove it. And if this somehow screws up your site, you've got bigger problems. Um, I also highly recommend Superfish. Um, you might know this as Suckerfish or Son of Suckerfish. They're all good. I prefer Superfish. Um, some of the things is it gives you a very forgiving focus. It does drop downs. So if you mouse over something, you'll get a drop down. Um, and you, if you move away for just a second, it stays down, but then it'll roll back up eventually. It's really super sweet. It's very tab friendly. You can tab through complex menus. Um, it supports touch, and it's based off of jQuery 1.9, and it's constantly updated. So there's no reason why you all shouldn't love it. Um, and since I really don't do a lot of jQuery, um, I lean on Superfish. I absolutely adore it. Um, access keys are really easy to add. Basically, you set something as an access key. You say access key equals whatever. When they hit their a combination of keys in that letter, it'll go to that page. It'll activate that thing. They're super easy to add. Um, I highly recommend, especially if you have more complex applications. So timing, timed forms. If you have anything where you have to complete the form within 15 minutes, um, OK. I understand sometimes you have to do this if you have like tickets or voting or something like that. Um, you know, but if you must, allow for time extensions. Um, allow them to ask for 10 more minutes. Um, warn them before their time is up, well before their time is up. Don't wait for a minute. Um, because it might be hard for them to get to the point where they can get that extension. So watch your extension usability. I had a guy who had a thing where he, they would time out after 50 minutes. Yeah, he'd warn them. There was no way to get to the button that said, give me more time if you were tabbing. And those are the people that would generally need more time. So modals, if you fix the modals, for the blinds so that their focus moves to the modal, so that they hear, you know, they know that it is a modal. Um, you fixed it for this group too. This is one of the nice benefits. If you fix it for one group, you often have fixed it for the other group. This is one of the few places in which you fix it for one person and you don't screw it up for everybody else. This is nice. This is a nice, you know, as somebody who's had to deal with this for a while, it's, you know, novel. Um, cognitive groups. So their annoyances, um, bad contrast, justified text, all caps. Um, overriding styles, lengthy text, uh, no pictures, and a loss of navigation. So let's talk about dyslexia. 
this is not a visual disorder. I get this all the time. Oh, it's the mirror text thing. They see things in reverse. No, 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 no. It's not just mirror text. It's actually an information processing disorder. Um, one of the things you want to avoid are serifs. Um, that's the little dangly things. Um, you can still use serifs in your headers or anything where you're using it sparingly, but for the most part, you want to use sans serif. Um, Web fonts are actually nice to use if you really need something super fancy because it allows for customization. They can override these. Um, and there are also special fonts for people who use dyslexia. It looks kind of like this. I'm not asking you to use them, but I'm saying they might use them. So you let, as much of text, let as much of the text on your website as possible be overwritten. Um, as for sentences, shorter is better. Eight to 12 words is good. Avoid compound, you know, don't do and, don't use semi semicolons, um, and don't do double space after the period. We're not using typewriters, people. Um, paragraph length, same thing. Um, forget grade school, you don't need to have intro, three support, and a closing. Um, you emphasize through isolation. If a sentence is very important, pull it, on, pull it out on its own. Um, and avoid long paragraphs. So images, they like images because they tend to anchor the reader. Um, they also allow for scanning up and down a page. Also, high contrast equals bad, so don't use pure black and pure white. Go for the dark, dark gray and the light, light white, and the, and the light, light gray. This is what justified text is. Um, you all know what this is, but it creates these like rivers, and people that have dyslexia will report seeing them move, they'll see colors, they'll see everything dance around it. It's kind of bizarre. This is why we don't use justified text. Animations. Avoid animations if at all possible. If you have to use them, loop them once. Um, and actually even better is to loop them on mouse over because let's be honest, none of us really like animations constantly going, no matter how much we like those cat gifs. If you have to use advertisements, try to make it so you can push them off the page. Here, the first one, they can scroll it off the page. The other one, they can decrease the window size. Most people are too lazy to take advantage of this, so you're not going to lose a lot of you know, eyeballs. Also, for navigation, make sure you have a consistent navigation uh, and try to indicate your current location. Now, as for ADD and ADHD, this is misnamed. It's actually, they have a plethora of attention. They just have trouble focusing it. Um, some of their annoyances are very similar. Um, if you have forms, show your progress, like how far they've gotten through the form. Um, bullet your instructions and try to paginate where possible where without annoying your other users. Also, try to break pages up if you can. Um, you can add the see all, everything on one page if you want, or give them an option to paginate. And highlight important text through the isolation. Also, make sure you have a consistent um, user experience. Don't switch things up as you go through your site. And also, I don't know if I'm going to have time to go through Hans Helen stuff, but look for him. He has a GitHub um, IO. I will post a link to Twitter. I'm sorry I'm running out of time. Um, so. Why would we sell it? Why do we want it to be accessible? Well, we don't want to be jerks. Um, two, a lot of their annoyances are our annoyances. We don't like all caps or long sentences or busy websites or things that are hard to navigate. Um, and you do have disabled users. Um, some numbers, 7.9 million um, can't read newsprint. Um, 8.3 million um, are blind in one or both eyes. 7% um, of all males are colorblind. And by the way, all my numbers are US-based because they have the most consistent gathering. Um, you know, you have 50 million who have arthritis. Um, 1 million are deaf in the United States. 36 million report hearing loss. And there's 40 million people in the United States with dyslexia. And eventually, we all join the club. Um, as we age, we join these groups. It's unfortunate, but we should really focus on making an excellent web now because we're going to need it sooner or later. And that's it.